All right, the title of the message this afternoon is Nor Covetous, Nor Covetous, and you'll understand the title here in a little bit, but I'm going to preach this whole message on covetousness, and I don't know that I've ever done that before, but I got to thinking about this a while back, like covetousness is one of those things that we kind of like make light of it, or we minimize it, you know, you think about all the sins out there, you're like, but covetousness, I mean, I mean, let's be honest isn't there don't we all like struggle sometimes with like wanting something that's not ours and isn't that covetous? <laughs> and you might think like you know well that's not really a big sin why make a big deal about it and so I want to talk about a few things here you know uh, primarily the questions might come like well where do we draw the line I mean how do you know when somebody's actually sinning when it comes to covetousness how would we decide you know, what, where, uh, where, to, where to draw that line or what is actually covetousness. And so the message is about covetousness. And I think it's very important to figure out what is covetousness and what, uh, where we're going to draw the line in because uh, the Bible treats it as a very serious sin, as we're going to find. And so it might be a little strange, you know, to think about that subject or to wonder. Hopefully after this message, it'll be a little bit clearer. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to jump right into it. We just read Exodus 20. And the first reason uh, we ought to make this a, a, a serious issue and figure out where we stand on this matter and where we draw the lines on covetousness is because of the fact that it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Now, I realize Ten Commandments were given Old Testament. They were given to Jews in that day, and we're not Jews. and We're not in the Old Testament. You know how everybody always says that kind of stuff. But look... Ten Commandments are Ten Commandments, right? We, we go around and we, we don't kill anybody. Why? We say, well, God doesn't want us to kill. He says, don't kill. We don't, you know, steal from people. Well, where in the Bible does it say not to steal? Right in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. It tells us what God doesn't want us to do, right? Don't have any idols and all. Uh, and so it's interesting when you get down to Exodus 20, verse 17, and perhaps some of you guys know this, but the Catholics have changed the order of the Ten Commandments. Did everybody know that? Right. The Ten Commandments, they'll say, uh, you know, we will say that thing about graven images is one of the commandments. Well, obviously that would, would go against the teachings of the Catholic Church. So they have actually, you can look this up if you don't believe it, because I, I, when I heard about that, I was just shocked. They're, they have Ten Commandments. But they skip right over that one about the graven images, and they lump that with the others. And when they get down to verse 17 here, this is where they make a division. They say, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his man, uh, manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And they say this, Commandment number 9, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or oxen or ass. <laughs> I kid you not, you look it up and they say, well, we've got to divide it somewhere because we know there's 10. The Bible says there's 10, so we've got to divide it somewhere. And so they divided up this one. Isn't that kind of interesting yeah. <laughs> and strange even? But that's what they do. And so here's what it's saying in chapter 17. It's, it, it, it makes these distinctions. It says it talks about coveting thy neighbor's houses, their, their neighbor's house. Coveting thy neighbor, I don't know why I got everything plural. I got coveting thy neighbor's wives. It just says wife. <laughs> it's like, man, that like, I already got four wives. I only got one. I'm, <laughs> I'm covet no, no, no. It says wife, right? Not coveting thy neighbor's wife. Not coveting thy neighbor's, neighbor's servants. That'd be like someone's employees or their workers. Or even, let's get this, a uh, pastor of one church might look over at another church and say, man, I wish I had those guys working for me, and you, you think, oh, that doesn't happen. W covetous can manifest itself in all kinds of weird ways, and we don't even, you know, we might not even know where somebody does that in their heart, and that's why I'm saying it's important to figure this out so we can establish some guidelines, like what do we treat as, okay, that person is a covetous person, right? Uh, you say, oh, well, that's judgmental. Thou shalt not judge. <laughs> but the Bible tells us to make a distinction, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Not to covet thy neighbor's ox or thy ass. Like not very many of our neighbors have beasts of burden anymore or, or those kind of things. But hey, we all know we can covet their cars. We can covet their tools and the things that they have. 
you know, their, their equipment, you know, that they, they use for different things. Uh, we can grow to covet those kind of things, it says, and it, 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 just in case it left something out, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Don't covet it. So number one, why it's important that we figure out more about this, it's one of the Ten Commandments. Number two, turn to 1 Corinthians 5. This one comes out, this verse comes up a lot, and I don't apologize for it because I think it's super important for churches to get this. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But the second reason we ought to be serious about this is because the Bible lists covetousness as something that, would disc, uh, that should get somebody kicked out of church. You say, whoa, that's, not, that's crazy. I mean, what? because I looked at something that I wanted, that it wasn't mine, I should be kicked out of church. So that's why we've got to decide what this means, right? Look at uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 5.11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such as one know not to eat. So there in that list, it says covetous person and you you want to figure out what how do i know if somebody's covetous how do i know if someone's doing wrong or if i'm doing wrong how do i know if i'm breaking that law and so uh it's important it's in this list i'm gonna come back to this first here in a minute because i kind of went out of order but uh, uh another reason is uh that we should make this an important thing is the bible lists this as something that should disqualify a pastor or even a deacon uh, I don't think it specifically says it about the deacon, but it's implied here. Uh, well, you know what? First, let's go to Exodus 18. Exodus 18. You might say there weren't any pastors or deacons in the Old Testament, but here is where a great principle was given to, was shown to uh, Moses that actually we see in Acts 6 being repeated, kind of a similar idea. Hey, there's too much on my plate. There's too much going on as a pastor, you know, or in this case, it was apostles. They said, we've got these certain things to do. We can't take the time to handle some of these other tasks. And so we need to appoint men over these tasks, right? Well, this was the first time we see such an idea. And it was because Moses was sitting and judging over the people and handling their affairs and trying to guide them and direct them. (laughs) And they're bringing, you talk about a million, two million people, whatever it was. And they're coming to him with their problems. And he's sitting one by one from sun up to sundown, handling all their problems. So his father-in-law, Jethro, says, hey, man, this is too big of a burden for you to take. It's going to wear you out, and this is going to wear out all the people, right? You've got other things you've got to do. And so he comes up with this. He says, here's what I think would be a much better idea. Exodus chapter 18, verse 17. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that they mayest bring the causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, look at this, able men, such as fear God. You're going to choose people to handle this task. You want able men. You want men that fear God. Men of truth, look at this one, hating covetousness. Isn't that interesting that he adds that one in there? And place them over them, to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of ten, and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, uh, every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easy for thyself, and uh, they shall bear the burden with thee. Now look over to 1 Timothy 3. We won't look at Titus, uh, where we see a parallel passage here, but just in... uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications of a pastor. 
1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, and one that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons, and then he explains some very similar uh, details with the deacons, which makes sense. All right, but right there he says specifically of the pastors, he says, not one that's covetous. And, and I think it's really compared because before that he said, he said uh, uh, not one who's given to filthy lucre. And you can start seeing how some of those kind of go together. And it's like somebody who's greedy and they want more and they want to have these things. And it's saying not to be like those and not to be covetous, uh, you know, if, if they're going to be a pastor. And so, first of all, we saw that covetousness is in the Ten Commandments. Second of all, the Bible lists covetousness as something that would disqualify someone from being a pastor or a deacon. Like I said, I went out of order. But the third one is the Bible lists covetousness among the sins that should get somebody kicked out of church. Okay, And the reason I wanted to do it in this order is because this leads right into the next point, and, and it's this. Not only is covetousness mentioned as a sin itself, but notice this, it's a precursor to other more major sins. And I think it's important to get this, okay? Why is covetous such a bad thing? Well, because covetous is going to lead you right into doing something far worse than just wanting something or desiring something. It's natural that we might see something and want it and it's not ours, but there's got to be somewhere. This is the line that we're trying to find. There's got to be something, a line that's crossed where people say, man, I want that so bad that I'm willing to do some, whatever it takes to get it. And having that mentality is going to lead you into doing something far worse. Okay, so back to uh, our verse there in 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11. I want you to notice this. <clears throat> it talks about fornication there. Think about this. Lusting after somebody is the precursor to fornication. Am I right? Jesus said this. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in his, uh, 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 with her already in his heart. Now, don't let somebody tell you. I, I, I hear this kind of stuff all the time. Well, there's no difference between lusting after somebody and committing adultery. There's a huge difference. <laughs> okay. But it's still wrong to lust after somebody. Right. It don't minimize that either and say like, well, at least I didn't commit adultery. No, no, no. You took that first step. Now, I'm glad you didn't commit adultery. Just like I'm glad you didn't kill somebody, but you took that first step and you hated your brother, right? right? All these things are precursors. Covetousness is the precursor, okay? So lusting would be a type of covetous, and that lusting is going to lead somebody to fornication or to adultery, okay? Also, we see uh, idolatry. Well, what would lead somebody to idolatry? Well, desiring a certain lifestyle. Now, let's just speak in terms of, of where we live right now, okay? Uh, a lot of things become idolatry in a person's life. Am I right? I mean, not, we're not just talking about idols, statues, false gods, or whatever. But a lot of things can become a god in somebody's life where they put that up above God. They make that an important thing. And they look at uh, how other people are living and the things that they have. And that can even become idolatry. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In verse 5, mortify therefore, or, or put to death, right? Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And here are your members, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Isn't that interesting that he calls covetousness idolatry? I mean, when you're desiring something, you're going after it, it's not long before that thing becomes more important to you than following after God and, and making the right choices in your life so that you won't do those kinds of things. 
So lusting after something is precursor to fornication. Desiring a certain lifestyle might be a precursor to idolatry. Desiring another person's job or their social status could become uh, the first step in somebody becoming a railer. You understand that? Think about, I'm not saying this is always the case, but you think about people that out of the blue, they just start railing on somebody, making all these fat, uh, false accusations and talking bad about them and, and all that. And you say, where does that come from? Like what would cause somebody to just go after another man and start attacking them and, and, and railing on them and creating all this, all this these fabrications? Now look, there's a time to call somebody out and say this person is doing wrong. Uh, but sometimes you'll find an, a, an instance where, where did that come from? Like, why are they making up all these things about this person or whatever? Oftentimes, and I'm not saying always, but oftentimes the root of that is they're jealous. They want that position. They want to have the fame and recognition that person has. They want to be able to have the lifestyle or do whatever that that person does. And so that causes them to, you know, become a railer. So that covetous uh, uh, could be the precursor to that. Uh, how about this? Desiring strong drink. <laughs> Like, I, I, I'll be honest, I never have, have had that desire. Praise the Lord, never had a desire. I was telling one of the kids on the way up, like, who, who wants to inhale smoke into their lungs? I never had a desire to smoke since I, I was a little kid. I remember that's disgusting. I never wanted to do that. My kids never did either that, I, that I'm aware of. <clears throat> now, before my parents got saved, right, my dad drank alcohol. And I remember as a little kid smelling it and saying, that smells disgusting. <laughs> especially after it's been thrown in the trash and it goes bad for a little while or whatever. And that smells awful, right? And so I never had a desire to do that, but somebody might. They might look at that lifestyle. They might look at the commercials and see the, everything that is associated with alcoholic beverages and say, man, that looks really good. And the moment that they look at that and they begin lusting after that, guess what? That's the first step to becoming a drunkard. And all these people are like, oh, well, the Bible says it's okay to take a little sip, drink a little bit, you know, as long as you don't become a drunkard. Well, I can't think of very many people I've ever known in my life that just like a couple sips here and there, and then that's it. Usually, and they cross that line somewhere, and they get drunk. And they say, oh, well, that wasn't so bad, you know. Next thing you know, man, they're just like, uh, you know, uh, drinking to, till they're drunk every night or whatever. It's crazy, right? And even if someone says, well, I don't think that'll happen to me. Well, can't you see how taking that first drink, you know, is, is your first step to become, I mean, why would you even want to go down that route, right? But not only that, the Bible says this, Proverbs 23, 31, look not upon the wine Amen. when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, at the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Amen. So he's saying, don't even look at this stuff. Amen. Looking at it creates a lust for it. Having that lust for it is going to lead you right down into the gutter like the drunkard. Right. So, yeah, we want to discipline somebody who's a drunkard. Say, hey, you know, it's not that we don't it's not that we hate you, but we, we don't want you to be involved in that sin. So if you're a drunkard, somebody stumbles in here and it's clear they've been drinking, you know, they're, you know, they're under the influence of something. We're going to have to usher them right out here. No, 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 there's no place for that. And we hear stories and we know about people getting drunk, you know, outside of this or whatever. That's something that we're going to have to investigate and, 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 and come down hard on. But what about covetous? Because that's in the same list, right? So how do you know when somebody's covetous? Okay, so it's in the Ten Commandments. It's something that's expected out of preachers. It's something that gets you kicked out of the church. Uh, it is not only a sin in itself, but it's a precursor to much worse sins. Now here's what, uh, what I would say are a couple guidelines or thoughts concerning where to draw the line, okay? Because really, this is one of those areas, and this is why I love the liberties that God gives independent churches, right? You know, this is a local church. It gives guidelines and says, hey, these things are bad. And then it's almost like this mentality in, uh, all throughout the Bible where it's saying, okay, among yourself, you're going to have to decide where do we draw the line? How do we go about the procedures of, of disciplining, you know, somebody in these situations? It's not going to give you the exact, I mean, it just says covetous. We're going to have to figure out what does that, what does that mean? It just says drunkenness. We're going to have to figure out when is somebody considered drunk. It just gives you certain things. Okay, so here are some guidelines that I just want to point out. Just, just uh, These are my thoughts on the matter. Number one, here are some things that aren't covetous. Right? If you know somebody involved in these things or, or whatever, these are not covetous. All right? 
Number one, having a good job and making a decent income. That's not covetous. <laughs> Now, there are people that would be like, oh, man, you know, they, they're just too worried about their job and always working all these jobs and trying to move up the ladder and doing all these things. Look, having a good job, making a decent income, that is not covetous. I can't, you know, you cannot show me from the Bible where that's covetousness. Getting advanced to a higher position within the company, that's not covetous. Somebody say, oh, well, why is he trying so hard to get ahead in his job? Shouldn't he be just more concerned about the church or whatever? Well, look, we, we live in this world Right? We're expected to work six days a week, right? That's what, according to the Bible standards. It's not wrong to have a job and to do the work. I mean, that's what God created us to do. People that sit around all the time and talking about, oh, well, they just work too much and they just so worried about their job. Guess what? A lot of times they're just lazy and they don't want to do any work. They just want to sit back and criticize everybody, right? With the like, holier than thou attitude or whatever. But actually, work is good for a person. And, uh, and, and somebody who's trying to get ahead, Advanced to higher positions or whatever, that is not covetousness. Uh, working lots of hours even. You know, a lot of these kind of go together, but I'm saying somebody working a lot of hours, you know, maybe they got to miss a service here or there. Man, I've grew up uh, my entire life, and look, I believe, hey, I understand, three to thrive, you know, every time the doors are open, you should be there. You know, I do think that should be a priority to assemble together and to be with your church. But look, man, if you're working for a company and they say, hey, we really need you to work, or, or maybe... Maybe uh, the, the family is really in a situation where you need to make some extra money or whatever. You take on a job. So you might get some criticism. Somebody might say, oh, man, you know, you're, you're, you, missed a, you missed a day of church or something like that. But that doesn't make a person covetous. We don't say, oh, that person's covetous, right? We've got to draw a line somewhere. I don't think that's it. Somebody working a lot of hours does not make them covetous. Here's another thing. Saving up money. Don't look at me because I'm bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> Saving up money and buying something that costs a lot, you know, you say, oh, they went on that trip. Can you believe that? Don't you know that they could have taken that money and sold it and sold it and given it to the poor? Yeah, that's what Judas said. <laughs> right? Somebody saves up their money and they says, hey, I, I would like to enjoy such and such with my family or I'd like to go on this trip or I'd like to do something. So I'm going to save up some money, work an extra job, do put some money in a jar, do whatever. That's not covetousness. All right. That's just saying, I just, want my, I just want to use my money to do something that I enjoy. Hey, there's a lot in the Bible about enjoying the fruit of your labor and the fruit of the work of your hands, and, and, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. Now, granted, I mean, come on, I'm a Baptist preacher. i got to say something about that. <laughs> granted, yes, we want you to go to church. Yes, we want you to give to the church. Yes, we want you to support the ministry. But that doesn't make you covetous. If you desire to save up something and, and, and buy something nice or whatever, and you know, the holier than thou people will always be out there to say, hey, you could have given that money to the poor or whatever. Here's another thing, because I mentioned covetous in relation to uh, lust, right? Covetous can, can, can manifest itself in like a lust. And if you lust after a woman, the Bible, you know, talks about commit adultery in your heart. So I mentioned how that's a precursor to that. But get this, singles... Pursuing a spouse, not covetousness. <laughs> Does that make sense? It's natural and it's right. And a, and a guy ought to be keeping his eyes open and looking and, and trying to talk to women and, and uh, vice versa. Although I don't think it's right for the women to just be approaching the men <laughs> in that way. But anyway, <clears throat> I'm old fashioned. <clears throat> All right. So those are some things that I don't believe are covetousness. Now, here are some things that I think are covetous because this is what we basically wanted to get down to. How do we draw these lines? Now, if a person is clearly lying, stealing and cheating to get gain. I mean, I realize lying, stealing, cheating, those are all sins in themselves. But look, if you see somebody heading that direction, even making steps towards that lying, stealing, cheating, and they're just wanting what the Bible calls filthy lucre, right? If they're lying, stealing, cheating to do that, they're committed to finding loopholes and everything and getting out of paying taxes or it's just like their whole life is just how can I beat the system, right? And it's going to cause them to lie. I guarantee you they'll start lying, stealing, cheating, right? And when you find someone that's gone down that road, that's covetous, right? They're cheating on their taxes. They're trying to find loopholes, beat the system and all that. They become dishonest. Uh, there's a problem there. That's good evidence that, hey, something's not right. And they're doing more than just uh, 
uh, you know, trying to uh, provide for their family or something like that. It's become this greed and this covetousness has taken them overboard. Number two, if a person is clearly, this goes back to the, uh, uh, the lust kind of thing. If you see a person and he's clearly flirting, whether it's a guy flirting with a lady or a lady flirting with a guy, flirting all the time, trying to get attention, particularly of married men or married women, you know, and you see that, man, there's something, there's just, I can just see it. Everybody can see those kind of people. And they're just flirting and they're flirting and flirting. Guess what? That person's covetous. And there's no place for that, you know. Uh, men, I'm going to tell you this, ladies. All right, I'll talk to the ladies and then I'll talk to the men. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to tell you this, ladies. You see it and the guys don't. I guarantee you. <laughs> All the ladies agree with me. And if my wife was here, she probably would have said amen and I would have had to say, shh, you're not supposed to. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's okay to agree with the preacher, okay? (laughs) But a lot of times wives see it, and they're like, that woman is after you. That woman's flirting with you. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like, she's too young. Or something like guys are like, but I'm old and ugly, right? Hey, it doesn't matter. Women can be covetous, and it doesn't matter. You know, there's different reasons that a woman will go after a guy, right? But but uh, uh, so I said I was talking to the women, but actually I'm talking to the guys, I guess. OK, listen to the women that say, hey, you better watch that girl. Right. And uh, and so there comes a time where if the wife is saying, hey, you need to keep an eye on that lady, man. She's very flirtatious. Yeah. Right. Then probably, you know, that's a good avenue to take and to start just deciding that. But sometimes people are just flirtatious and they're going after uh, married men or men that they shouldn't have you know, or or vice versa. Obviously, a lot of guys uh Flirt, flirt with women, and uh, you know, in my life, uh, I struggled in my early life with lust, like most guys do, and my eyes wandered when they shouldn't have wandered, and uh, and I thought, well, once I get married, that'll go away, and I found out early in my marriage it didn't go away. You know, there were, I loved my wife, and I would never want to hurt her, but my mind still wandered, right? But it didn't take long before I realized, you know what? I'm just going to cut this off, man. I'm not going to have any kind of relationships with women, you know. I'm not going to be alone with a woman in a work situation. I'm not going to be calling them on the phone, texting them, and doing all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I sometimes, and I don't want it to ever look rude, but I sometimes tr- avoid uh, shaking hands sometimes with some women, right? And it's just like, you know, I just don't want there to be any kind of weird feelings or anybody accuse me of something. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm human. I'm going to notice if a lady's attractive or something like that. But in my mind, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to avoid that. And that's, and if somebody it can't control that and they're just constantly flirting and trying to be alone with people and doing all that, there's something wrong. Okay. They've crossed a line and, uh, and that would be covetous. <coughs> and the third thing is this the final thing. If people are always constantly, uh, if they're constantly desiring recognition, in positions, all right? Now, I haven't, you know, I'm certain, I don't feel like I'm talking to anybody in here for sure. In fact, I feel like in here there's a bunch of guys that you try to give them a position or say, hey, how about you do this? And they're like, oh, no, there's somebody more qualified than me. But, uh, but if you get somebody, because they exist, and they're everywhere, and all they want is a position, put me in charge of something, right? And they want to criticize everybody who does have a position. Why do they get a position? Why do, you know, why do you spend more time with that person? Why don't you, you know... That's probably a person who's covetous, right? They're wanting a position. They're wanting recognition. Probably wanting filthy lucre. I mean, all these things, there's a reason all the lists in the Bible put those all together, right? And so you want to watch those people. If they're complaining uh, when other people receive the gifts, that's a covetous person. The Bible says we should rejoice when somebody else is, is, uh, uh, excels. And, uh, and certainly, I mean... How about doing others as you would have others doing to you? How about whenever you, somebody gets an advancement or somebody gets a, a something, recogn- you know, they're recognized for something, uh, how about you just rejoice with them, right? If there's something inside you that says, well, how come that didn't happen to me? It's probably nothing. It's probably just, you know, <laughs> it's not like you were overlooked or that you're a bad person or whatever. Uh, so just keep on working, right? If, if you feel like, man, maybe I didn't do something right or whatever. But, you know, like this next uh, a couple Sundays from now, we're having a service where I'm recognizing workers. 
And I didn't think about it at first. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. I can't wait to thank certain people. And then I got to thinking in my head, oh, I better mention so-and-so. I better mention so <laughs> I don't want to leave anybody out. I might have hurt, hurt feelings. Then I got to thinking, that's ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> you can't go through the whole life like just trying, you know, uh, like everybody gets a participation trophy <laughs> or something like that, right? You've just got to just go ahead and do what the Lord calls you to do and do what you think is best. But look, if somebody's out there like, how come he didn't recognize me? And man, they're out there, and I do meet them. They're just, I don't, there's nobody in this group, but, uh, but I do meet them. It seems like all they want is recognition. That person's probably covetous, right? So there's just some guidelines that I think that we could recognize. But here's the thing. It typically is going to lead them into a greater sin, so you're going to start seeing them entering into sin, and you can say, man, that person's covetous. They might not be committing adultery, but they're on their way there. They might not be stealing and embezzling or whatever, but I tell you they're on their way there. Uh, and so that would be uh, a good sign that someone's covetous. So, again, I think it's interesting, those lists. You know, you see the drunkard, the extortioner, the idolater, all those kind of things. But it says, nor covetous. And so it's something we got to guard ourselves with, this idea of covetous. we got to guard our own hearts. we got to guard, guard the church and our families. And, uh, and we got to guard uh, one another. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you uh, for all that you've given us if we're truly thankful uh, for what you give us and understand that, uh, that all gifts come from you and, uh, and uh, even promotion is of the Lord. And, and when we think of all those things and we're grateful, Lord, I think maybe we don't have a place in our heart for co being covetous. And uh, Lord, if any of us in here would get to a point in our lives where we'd struggle with that in one way or another and desire things that you don't intend for us to have, I pray you just open our eyes to see uh, that, we're, that we have that struggle, uh, and you would convict us of that and help us get that right. And Lord, I pray that you will protect this church from anybody that would come in and, and uh, be covetous and, and desirous of things that they shouldn't desire. Certainly, Lord, uh, anything that's going to be the first step into a major sin, help us recognize it and, uh, and put a stop to it before it gets any farther. Lord, we thank you for your work. It's your work. We give you glory for it. I pray you be uh, blessed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.